Hello, and welcome to Radio Free Acton, the podcast of the Acton Institute, dedicated to the study of religion and liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts. On this episode, I'll be talking with Stephen Nichols, author, editor, and president of the Reformation Bible College in Sanford, Florida. Stephen joins me on this episode to talk about the life of Francis Schaeffer, one of the most influential apologists of the 20th century. After that, you'll be hearing from occasional host Bruce Walker, as he's joined by John Errett, writer and executive editor at Conciliar Post, to talk about Netflix's recently released series, Watership Down, based on the 1972 book by Richard Adams. If you're looking for any of the resources or articles mentioned in this episode, they're all linked in our show notes, published every Wednesday at blog.acton.org. Lastly, I want to let you know that in the near future, this podcast will go through a rename, changing from Radio Free Acton to Acton Line. Two words, Acton Line. This podcast has gone through significant development in the past year, and we wanted to give it a better name and brighter cover, so be on the lookout. We'll still be bringing you the same content every Wednesday, and if you're already subscribed to this podcast, you won't have to resubscribe. It's the same podcast, but with a facelift. And of course, if you're not subscribed, you can do so today on Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any of your other favorite podcast directories. Today to talk with me a bit more about the life and legacy of Francis Schaeffer is Stephen Nichols, the president of Reformation Bible College in Sanford, Florida, and the editor of Schaeffer on the Christian Life by William Edgar. Stephen, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. In the Acton Institute's archives, we keep a list of people who have contributed to religion and liberty throughout history. And this list includes C.S. Lewis, Thomas Aquinas, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and it also includes Francis Schaeffer. I wanted to talk a bit more about his life for the podcast as his birthday approaches on January 30th. Can you give us a brief overview of what his life looked like? Maybe where did he come from and basically how did he become such a large evangelist? Yeah, absolutely. So he was born in 1912, spanned most of the 20th century, dying in 1984, and was very engaged, as you put it, uh, lived through basically the rise and fall of communism um, and saw it firsthand in Europe, as well as secularism in the United States. Uh, Early on, uh, his dad had hopes for him to be sort of a craftsman engineer and sent him to Drexel in Philadelphia, and uh, he studied there as an undergrad. But he felt a real pull to pastoral ministry, so he left Drexel and went to a Presbyterian college in Virginia, Hampton, Sydney. And at his graduation, this is in the 30s, he went to then the uh, start-up seminary, Westminster Theological Seminary. It had been founded in 29 by J. Gresham Machen. Machen was a longtime professor at Princeton. This is right in the throes of the liberalism, modernist, fundamentalist controversy. Machen founded Westminster, and Schaefer was one of the early students. He was there 36, 37, studied with John Murray, Machen, the apologist Cornelius Van Til. Um, And then Schaefer got involved in a group that was very strict, very fundamentalist. They called themselves the Bible Presbyterian Church. And Schaefer actually left Westminster, graduated from their seminary called Faith Theological Seminary. This was in 37, 38, and went on to pastor for 10 years. Uh, He pastored in Grove City um, in Pennsylvania, pastored in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and then for two years was in St. Louis, Missouri. So for a decade, he's a pastor. Then in 1947... um, he made an exploratory trip to Europe. And the next year, he moved with his wife, Edith. She had been, her parents were missionaries to China. And as they say, right, the rest is truly history. Uh, they set up Le Brie, which means the shelter in Switzerland. And this was unique. I, I don't know of anything quite like this in the history of the church, Le Brie. Uh, we, we can get into it later. Uh, Next, he set up one in the UK, uh, and then, of course, they were established in the United States, and so that was his legacy. So you could really divide his career into three phases. There was that early sort of fundamentalist, separatist pastor phase for 10 years. There is the Labrie 
phase, which goes from 48 really until 76. And then with the publication of his How Should We Then Live, followed by the film series the next year, you could see him moving to a much more political activism uh, and very engaged and then teams up with the former Surgeon General of the United States, C. Everett Koop, with his book, Whatever Happened to the Human Race, and coins a term we call co-belligerence uh, and is very involved in euthanasia debates, the abortion issue, and basically just fighting secularism in the United States. So you know, 10 years as a pastor, Labrie from 48 to 76, and then really those last eight, 10 years of his life, the years of his very intense social cultural activism. And uh, that's the life of Francis Schaeffer. Let's dive in a little bit to Labrie, because I know that Francis Schaeffer saw such a value in investing in younger generations in his day. And he's probably best known for his ministry to young adults through Labrie. What exactly was Labrie and what made it unique? This is the beauty of the book, The Schaefer on the Christian Life. It was written by Bill Edgar, who's a apologetics professor at Westminster. He was a Harvard student and not a Christian at all, not from a Christian family at all. His parents, his father was in the diplomat at Diplomatic Corps and Foreign Service and all. And so Bill's a Harvard student and spends the summer backpacking in Europe and shows up at Labrie, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night or so, and engages in conversation with Francis Schaeffer. And sometime between 2 and 3 a.m., Bill Edgar comes to Christ. <laughs> so this is what Francis Schaeffer did. Uh, he just engaged these college kids. And what he saw was what they saw, you know, the establishment in this post-war Europe. The establishment was not really answering these kids' questions. But neither was the revolution or the sort of hippie movement <laughs> that they were – that was soon developing either in emerging – and Schaefer knew that the ultimate answers were, whether it was communism or secularism, they were rejecting God. And, you know, he, he writes his book, He is There and He is Not Silent. Um, God is the answer. God has spoken to the issues of life. And he just, he had a remarkable ability to just talk with people and let them talk. And in the course of the conversation, they just saw their need for Christ and the gospel, and Schaefer just applied the gospel to their particular situation in their lives. And people came to Christ. That's what was happening at Labrie for decades. So before we even started recording, I know that you and I had talked about the value of reading a biography of a figure in life who was written that was written by someone who actually knew this figure personally. So as you were working on this project with Edgar, and as you were reading it, did you learn anything about Schaefer that surprised you or maybe something that you hadn't known before? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, like I said, I think the issue, and I had known this, and I sort of, when I taught apologetics, I would use Schaefer as an example for a conversation. You know, don't underestimate the value of just simply talking to people. But reading the book really underscored it. I think sometimes we can especially Christians who want to engage in culture, we can sometimes engage from like the 36,000-foot view. We, we talk about points of view and worldviews and particular issues and people who hold those issues, but sometimes we do that rather abstractly, and we treat people as caricatures or we treat people as types, and we forget they're actually persons, you know, individual persons made in the image of God <laughs> with individual needs. And Schaefer really drove that home. He could do both. He could speak capably and competently to the movements of culture and the big picture issues. But he could also break out from that and talk one-on-one -on -one to a person. And I think, you know, Bill Edgar taught me at Westminster Seminary. He was one of my favorite profs and had a huge impact on me. And he's taught seminary for decades. He was influenced by Francis Schaeffer. And I think how many individual people were influenced by Schaeffer who went on to influence and have an impact. And so that was – I knew that about Francis Schaeffer. I knew that he stressed that value of conversation with individuals. Um, 
but the book really impressed it upon me. And Bill uh, Edgar did such a good job in writing the book to just drive that point home. I'm going to switch gears here a bit because I want to touch on his awareness of the times he was living in. I think this book really highlights that as being a greater strength of his. Schaefer is said to have fought relentlessly upon uh, social decline and spiritual impoverishment. And in the book, it says, quote, he was concerned about tyranny and the fate of a culture that was callous about human life. So basically, he noticed an abandonment of truth that affected everything from government to art to education. So I think he touches on so many subjects and it's hard to maybe just pick one that is most important, but I do think that there's an overarching theme of um, impressing upon us the fact that the times that we're living in now do tempt us to devalue human life. If there was one thing that maybe, or one way that Schaefer battled this that we can learn from and apply to today, what do you think that that would be? Hmm. Well, first, uh, I think your analysis is is right on the mark in terms of what Schaefer saw and what he saw in the 70s and the 80s and then where he stood in the gap uh, to speak to it. And in the end, you know, his his book, Whatever Happened to the Human Race, is really just a plea for human dignity and a reality to not uh, a call to see human beings valued not for their economic function or their economic capacity, whether that's communism, they're sort of reduced to a cog in the wheel as a human being, and they've lost their humanness. Schaefer saw that. But it can also happen in a materialism, secularism, where value is really determined by a person's contribution to society, and we're talking about economic metrics at that point. And I think it's even easy for us to sort of slip into that. As Christians even, we can value people on what they can do for us. And then we, then we sort of hierarchicalize those relationships we have in our lives. And even how we view other people. Schaefer just constantly reminded us. And, and here's, here's the beauty of it. As a theologian, he reminded us of this on the image of God. As a cultural apologist, social activist, he reminded us of it and the need to speak out to, you know, Roe v. Wade. He was very engaged at at the cultural moment of Roe v. Wade. But here's the other piece to this. Schaefer was a pastor, and one of his best sermons is, no little people, no little places. And it, it really gets to, you know, the rubber meets the road. We can talk about oh, we believe human beings are created in the image of God. But in practice, do we value people differently? You know, this is the book of James, right? The wealthy person comes in, like, oh, hey, sit here. <laughs> We've got this great seat for you. But, you know, the, the poor, will you stand in the back, right? If, if the first century church was susceptible to it, we are susceptible to it. And here comes Francis Schaeffer, no little people, Right. Do we truly value people? Do we see them as the image of God? Do we view people as an interruption to our daily life, or do we see them as our calling? Um, that's where I think Schaefer really helps us. You know, God put us here to serve others. Even though he was he was so influential, he was very humble in the way that he approached his apologetics. Well, that's the, I think that really is the beauty of Schaefer. You know, he could write a book, and people quibble, and I quibble. I'm not sure he got Aquinas right. I think sometimes he oversimplified things. You know, he had the two lines, and, and we go below the line. All right, we can quibble about all that stuff. But what a remarkable mind. And, and here's a guy who was able to be both a gr- brilliant thinker who could identify the ideas and the consequences of ideas – and at the same time, carry on a conversation with an unregenerate person and show the compassion of Christ and the mercy of the gospel to that person. That's hard to do. And um, I think that's Schaefer's contribution. And I think the book really brings that out. And, you know, we, we can applaud the Schaefer of Escape from Reason or How Should We Then Live? Um, but there's also the Schaefer who just cared about people and and spend time with actual people. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me, Stephen. I could talk about this subject forever, but I am so glad to have gotten you on the phone so you could shed a little bit more light on it for us. 
Oh, my pleasure. Glad, glad to talk about uh, Schaefer and grateful for you all there at the Acton Institute and the work you're doing. So God bless in your work. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. And same to you. more than one million words of trenchant journalism under his byline, and more citations in the Penguin Dictionary of humorous quotations than any living writer, P.J. O'Rourke has established himself as America's premier political satirist. Join us for an evening in Chicago featuring best-selling author P.J. O'Rourke on Thursday, March 7. You don't want to miss out on this evening filled with humor, wit, and engaging dialogue. O'Rourke's best-selling books, including his newest release, None of My Business, will be available at the dinner for purchase and signing. Make sure to save your spot today and register at acton.org slash events. That's acton.org slash events. Hello and welcome back to Radio Free Acton. I am Bruce Edward Walker and today I will be talking with John Errett, who is an attorney and he is also a fairly well-known up-and-coming writer of blogs on cultural aspects of what's happening in the world today. And he has written a very wonderful piece on Watership Down, which is a recent Netflix and BBC production that uh, just came out over the Christmas holidays. Good morning, John. How are you? I'm doing great, Bruce. How about yourself? I'm doing very well. Thank you. So listen, Watership Down, it's been a book that's been around since um, my high school, college years. And uh, it's got, you know, little bunny foo-foo on the cover and it's been adapted twice before. So why is it that an uh, Acton audience would be interested in this? So I think there are a couple different reasons why Watership Down has really stood the test of time. And the first one would be that it's simply a really good story. And I definitely saw Little Rabbit Foo-Foo on the cover and was like, I'm not picking up this book at first. Then when I gave it a try, I realized how close a resemblance it really bears to some of the great works of Western literature, like the Aeneid and the Odyssey. And the, the literary motifs that come through as you're reading the book are really pretty timeless. But then on a different level, the book really has a lot of fascinating things to say about how different communities and specifically political communities should be structured and thrive both in terms of internally to themselves and in their relations with other communities. Well, listen, before we go deep dive into that, let's give a little bit of a synopsis of what the story is about, because you, when you say Odyssey and Aeneid, those kind of bring up some pretty lofty literary competition. So why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the story is actually about? What can readers expect if they pick it up? So the book begins with our protagonist, Hazel, and his young brother, Fiverr, who happens to be kind of a seer or a clairvoyant, having a vision of coming destruction to their rabbit warren at Sandalford. And Fiverr kind of plays the role in Watership Down as Cassandra in the uh, Iliad or in the Aeneid, foreseeing the coming destruction of one's homeland. As a result of that prophecy, Hazel and a few other rabbits, including Fiverr, depart from their warren which is subsequently destroyed by humans who are using backhoes to construct a new development. And Hazel and Fiverr and everybody else kind of set forth on a journey across England in search of a new place that they can call their home. And they meet various figures along the way, some of whom have uh, malign intentions and some of whom choose to help them. The second point that you bring up about the book in, in, in your essay for uh, Patrick Henry College is uh, that it is a rich introduction to political theory. So why don't, why don't you elaborate on that? So the big question that drives a lot of the book is how do we collectively build a society that reflects our values? And that's something that comes through in all the rabbits that speak together, Hazel and everyone else, in terms of the society that they want to build once they've left uh, the destroyed one behind. And as they're progressing, they generally start out in a democratic process where they're all making collective decisions and they choose Hazel to be like they're kind of the representative or their leader. As they're progressing, though, they encounter other societies that don't follow a kind of democratic model. In the, as we see in the new Netflix show, one of the first ones they encounter is sort of a theocratic kind of death cult where they go to this rabbit warren and everyone's perfectly well fed. Everyone seems happy, but the rabbit warren is empty. 
And the rabbits are very well fed, but some of them just disappear at random intervals. And it soon becomes clear that the rabbit warren is being maintained by farmers who are using that warren as a source of rabbits for themselves to hunt and kill. And their political society is structured around this kind of cycle of death rather than any other human value, or I should say any other rabbit value. Uh, that would might inform a community. So they don't really see beyond just immediate destruction and forming different responses to that destruction. And as you, the story progresses, we encounter the main antagonist of the story, which is the evil rabbit warren of Ephrafa. And Ephrafa in the book functions kind of as a surrogate for the Soviet Union or other totalitarian regimes. And the principles that underlie this rabbit warren are security against human beings, foxes, owls, any other threats to rabbits is the ultimate and paramount goal. Anything else, including liberty or culture or other essential aspects of what it means to be a a human or a rabbit, just have to be uh, swept aside because security is the paramount goal. And so society functions in an incredibly authoritarian and oppressive way. The authoritarian is uh, Ben Kingsley's voice, uh, General Woundwort, for a show that uh, is kind of geared towards the family. Kind of a terrifying character. He's very Stalin-esque. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit more. So um, what is it that Adams is trying to do with the the character of of Woundwort? So one of the most interesting aspects of Woundwort's character is his origin. And it soon becomes clear as the story progresses that Woundward is a former hutch rabbit. He escaped from being a captive rabbit among humans at one previous point. And he got to be where he is, at the head of the Ephrafa Warren, through violent combat and defeating everyone that might threaten him, and ultimately just setting himself up as the best fighter of the whole bunch. It becomes clear that he's doing that in response to his own experiences. So he's seen what he believes to be the horrors of a world that doesn't have security, where one is prey to all sorts of forces beyond their control, in this case, human beings. And that informs his kind of paranoid analysis of what rabbits can and should be. Also in your essay, you, you discuss the uh, the importance of heroism and myth and fable and how that leads into uh, inspiring heroism in the modern day, as it does the, the allegorical characters, uh, the anthropomorphized characters in Watership Down. Yeah, that's one of, that was one of my favorite aspects of the novel as a whole, and it's still there in the new Netflix series, although it's a little bit understated to some extent. So as the book progresses, things are folk aspects of rabbit folklore interwoven into the the story. So you have stories about how rabbits got their cotton tails, how rabbits got their jumping legs, and all of these things ultimately trace back to kind of a legendary folk hero, El Herrera. And El Herrera's stories are one of the biggest things that the rat that constitute the rabbit's community that they take with them from their destroyed homeland and that they bring with them to the new places in which they settle. And when things get really bad for our protagonists, it's the stories of El Herrera that inspire them to keep going when things are really pressed to their utmost. Now, the show does emphasize this a little bit, and that's how this, the, the series opens with kind of this backstory of how rabbits came to be in their own account. So their, their mythos unfolds in a sense. But one of the difficulties with the new show is that the impact of those stories on our protagonists simply doesn't seem to show up as much as it does in the novel. So storytellers in the book uh, really function as almost priests of the rabbit's history and tradition who really are constitutive of their identities as rabbits and in their communities. But in the show, the storytellers come off more as entertainers, more as performers. And so some aspect of what it means to really lean into one's history and tradition as informing one's community is a little bit lost in the show. Well, um, I I think to be fair, you could almost say that about all of culture now is that we don't look to the old stories. Unfortunately, too often we we turn away from the the stories that our respective faiths have have given to us over the years and that we look toward pop culture to replace that. Absolutely. So you, you go on in your essay to talk about the custodianship of the past as an essential component of any liberal arts education. So where does Watership Down fit in uh, that paradigm? 
So I think Watership Down really functions, it's almost an exemplar of what it means to have reached the point where one has been educated and one does carry certain understandings that stem from faith traditions and stem from the Western literary and intellectual tradition as a whole forward. So the kind of characters that we see in the novel and in the show are characters who have been informed by this kind of education, informed by this kind of upbringing. And so we see in these characters heroism and their acts of virtue, I guess we could say, we see people who have internalized and been changed by that kind of educational process. So we see kind of the culmination of what that sort of educational process should lead to as borne out in the lives of its characters. You're, you're talking about narratives, both factual and fictional, and uh, you, you bring up, for example, Caesar crossing the Rubicon, Achilles and Hector fighting at the gates of Troy, Hamlet confronting the threat of existential despair. What, what the, the rabbits of the Watership Down Warren are actually encountering then is something that uh, you would believe we as humans face on a day-to-day basis? Absolutely. And I think insofar as we see ourselves as being independent from any particular tradition, we're ultimately setting ourselves up to be susceptible to whatever narrative we're told by somebody else is an authoritative one. And so you see people being in the Watership Down being drawn into General Wound Wart's way of thinking and his mindset to the extent that they're already not connected to a tradition that precedes them and informs what they do. So in ice being alienated and isolating oneself from tradition, one ultimately finds oneself swept into more authoritarian traditions that claim not to be those traditions themselves. One, one, one last uh, point that uh, you brought up that I, I really think that I'd like to draw out for our listeners is that each new generation must choose whether to pass on the, our cultural heritage or let it wither. And you say that is the similarly present in our membership within the Christian church. What it means to be Christian in a deep sense is informed not just by abstract ethical statements that we assent to, but it's rooted in the fact that the events of Christianity happened in time, in the real human span of existence. So we as Christians today aren't emancipated in some sense from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or from the particularity of Christ entering the world in Judea, in Bethlehem, in a very particular moment in history. And that tradition, rooted in real history, ultimately has to inform how we see the present. And to the extent that we understand who we are as Christians or try to come up with a Christian identity that isn't rooted in that history and tradition, which precedes us, we're ultimately just inventing a way of thinking that bears no resemblance to that which we've inherited. This is a a fairly lengthy book, and it, it moves along very, very quickly. How would you rate this animated adaptation compared to the book as well as the the previous animated adaptations? Not having seen all the previous animated adaptations, I can't speak to those, but I can definitely say that compared to the book, I, I was I was pleasantly surprised how much of the core essence of the story was still there. So I'd probably give it a seven and a half out of ten as an adaptation of the book. And that in large part, I think, is due to the the really strong production values that under underpin this new adaptation. So you've got a wonderful voice cast with people like James McAvoy, um, John Boyega, Ben Kingsley, as you mentioned. And that really lends a degree of professionalism to everything that's going on. And it's, it really, you really get into the inner lives of these rabbits and you forget that you're watching rabbits as the story progresses. The music is outstanding. The graphics and visual effects are fine, if not necessarily outstanding. But the the fundamental tension and power of the story is really well captured by the new adaptation. So that's something that I really appreciated. My only disagreements, or I guess uh, the questions I might have with the new adaptation, tend towards the the thematic direction. So kind of the downplaying of some of the tradition and history elements of the story. And also the fact that certain parts of the story are reframed in terms of an antagonism between human beings and the natural world in a sense that didn't necessarily come through in the original book. So in the book, one of the major turning points, and spoiler alert, one of the rabbits is helped by a human being at a critical juncture in the story. And that, that does get mentioned at one point in the show, 
But by and large, the new show positions human beings as kind of an evil and destructive force that are taking over the world, annihilating everything in their path and annihilating all of nature. And the natural world has to stand against that. And so General Wound Ward is to some extent justified, the new show tells us, in being very concerned about human beings' relations with the natural world. There's no possibility of coexistence in General Woonwart's imagination, and I'm not sure how much of a, a vision of coexistence is there in the showrunner's mind either. John Errett, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about Watership Down. I really do appreciate it. Uh, uh, so you'd give the, the book a definite thumbs up, and you would give a an enthusiastic, if less than wholehearted exhortation for the Netflix BBC series. Absolutely. And thanks so much for having me. You bet. John Errett is an attorney based out of Virginia and is a regular contributor to American Conservative as well as other conservative publications and quite the astute cultural critic. So thank you so much. And for Radio Free Acton, I'm your host, Bruce Edward Walker. We'll speak to you again. As always, thank you for listening. To learn more about the Acton Institute and what we do, visit our website at acton.org. If you want to reach our podcast team here at Acton, email us at rfa at acton.org or leave us a message at 888-705-4180 to give us feedback and to let us know what you think of the show. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to swing over to iTunes and leave a review and rating. This episode is produced by me, Caroline Roberts, with audio mixing by Nathan Moore.